colder day today, but we got through it so far. The uh, Lord is good. The Lord is always good. His blessings rain upon us. We've been talking a lot about that this time of year. We'll be spending some time even Sunday uh, looking at, again, just how the Lord provides. And uh, we're going to be in tonight in Habakkuk. I'm probably going to say that three different ways tonight. Uh, I don't know how to say it right. Habakkuk, Habakkuk. Pastor Loggins, what's the proper pronunciation in the Hebrew, brother? Oh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> So uh, we're going to be looking at this this evening. So if you would turn there, and uh, there is a lot packed in uh, to this small book. So uh, we'll go through your handout there if you would, and uh, we'll make our way through this this evening as we always do. Uh, you also have an outline there provided with the handout uh, that if you want to go back through this book, it shouldn't take you long to read through. Uh, you can take that outline and go a little bit more in depth uh, with what we're even been doing here in our evenings together. So uh, first and foremost, when we see this book, we see God is good and right, just in his dealings and worthy to be praised. And I think all of us would say amen to that. Uh, regardless of what state we're in, uh, we have a good God and we know that he is just. Uh, we know his dealings are just. And in all of this, he is worthy to be praised. One of the illustrations uh, from uh, an author speaking of this, uh, we've all heard the story. A man traveling abroad from his work uh, went, went for several months through other countries uh, where life was hard, uh, conditions were minimal, the food was different, uh, different than what he was uh, used to, water wasn't safe to drink, uh, just all of the accommodations were inadequate. And when he came back to the airport, he was greeted by his friends in the United States and uh, they asked him and said, well, how does it feel to be home? And he couldn't really muster the words to say so. He fell on his knees and kissed the ground and finally when he got up, he said, that's exactly how I feel. And uh, if you've ever been abroad, I'm sure many of you have felt that way before. The strange part of this illustration of the story, rather, is that before he made his journey, uh, he was like most other people. And in other words, when he was here in the States, he had a tendency to grumble, to criticize, uh, finding faults in really all the areas of the goodness of his life that he was just overlooking. And that didn't dawn on him until he went abroad. And what we see with an illustration like this is how quickly uh, it just changed his reality, how quickly it changed his perception, and how thankful he was then for uh, really all that he he had, all that God had blessed him with, a new sense of values, a new sense of priorities. And the illustration goes like this. This is similar to what really happened to uh, Habakkuk. Uh, the story begins, we hear him complaining to the Lord about the conditions around him. Uh, that's what this book is centered around. We see uh, Habakkuk just uh, really pleading with God about what was going on in this time, uh, really talking about the circumstances, but he saw wicked uh, prospering and it weighed heavy on him. Uh, so much that uh, he come to the point where he, see, he felt uh, that no one was doing anything about it, even including God. Now we know uh, God is in control and that's really what we're going to learn uh, as we go through this book tonight is the lesson that Habakkuk learned as well, uh, that God has all of these things under control. Uh, God is just and right. He, he provides for all of our need, and we'll see as we go through these verses tonight of uh, that very truth. But as we start with that illustration, just compare yourself right now for a minute to anyone who is in that position. You know, have we grumbled lately? Have we complained a bit lately? Have we found ourselves griping a little bit more than usual? And yet when we consider all that we have, all that God provides, 
you know, just to be honest, we should be the last ones to be complaining and griping. Uh, we should be the first ones to, as this man did when he got back to the States, fall on our knees before God and simply just say, thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you for all that you provide. And uh, what a perfect time of year, uh, even around Thanksgiving, to consider these things. You know, it's, as I say many times, it's amazing how God, through his spirit, weaves these lessons together uh, for the time we are even today. Uh, some introduction, number one for you. God is stronger than the evil in the world. Uh, there's a parallel between uh, this book of Habakkuk and even in this thought that we're dealing with in Psalm 37, uh, verse uh, really 1 and then verse 40. Psalm 37 verse 1 says, Fret not thyself because of evildoers, neither be thou envious against the workers of iniquity. Right, so we're going to see uh, really God relaying that message to Habakkuk as we go through this. But then in verse 40 of Psalm 37, it goes on and says, And the Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. That's talking about the children of God. Those that uh, are in Christ, that's how the relationship they have with the Lord. So Psalm points out clearly that yes, there'll be evil doers around us, there'll be workers of iniquity, and in that fret not thyself. God has all those things under control. And then also we see the, just the promise that God's going to deliver us from these things. Those of us that trust in him have a hope uh, that God has a plan through all of these. So God is stronger than the evil in the world. This book opens with gloom and ends with glory. We'll, we'll read a little bit here out of chapter 1 in just a bit. And I see really how perplexed Habakkuk was, what was weighing on his heart. Uh, I think as I read through this, and I've read it many times, you just get a sense of, uh, this is a man that r really uh, was bothered by the sin he was seeing around him and, and also was bothered by the sense that he just didn't seem to have a sense that God was even doing anything about it. But yet in his conversation with the Lord and then in the Lord's response, we see him really just turn about and even then through the midst of, of his life and how he was feeling, we get glimpses that he even recognized that through all of this turmoil or evil, God was still in control. We're going to point some of those things out here tonight. The book, or rather the doubts of the prophet, they turn to shouts. Uh, number two, the book is a defense of God's goodness and power even with the existence of evil. And again, the book is a defense of God's goodness and power, even in the existence of evil, which leads us right to number three for your fill-in tonight. Habakkuk was honest enough to ask the Lord hard questions. And many look at this man and say, well, he maybe was in depression, and uh, maybe he was. Uh, maybe he just considered what was going on around him and was bothered by it to a point where it perplexed him. But yet he was still a man that was able to go to the Lord and give his concerns to the Lord. We must trust in the justice of God if we are to properly worship and praise him. And that's where we're going to try to weave this in tonight, right? We live in a similar world. Uh, we could see evil, what we would consider evil prospering around us. Uh, we understand God's in control. There may be times where maybe we feel there aren't enough people doing anything about it. Or maybe there are times we feel like, Lord, why, uh, why, why aren't you intervening more, uh, more how we would? Or however we think those thoughts. Yet, as we just said, we must trust in the justice of God if we are to properly worship and praise him. In other words, it'll bleed over into how we worship him. It'll bleed over into how we praise him. Right? So if Habakkuk was to stay in gloom and doom, Right? He wouldn't have praised the Lord. So let's look at this book. Title and date. Habakkuk means, anyone know? Anyone have that off the top of their head? Embrace. Very good. Or embracer. He embraced an incredible love for God. 
Habakkuk was the last of the minor prophets. We don't know much about him, uh, similar to the other prophets as well. We do know he wrote to the southern kingdom of Judah before the Babylonian captivity, about 606 B.C., which just to put this in perspective for you, remember Nebuchadnezzar was first invaded Judah about 605 B.C. That's when he took Daniel and the others as captives to Babylon. So we have a sense of this setting, right? This was what Habakkuk was up against. Uh, number five for you was he was commissioned to announce God's intention to punish Judah by the Babylonian captivity. So he goes before the Lord. We'll see some of this. He lays out his cry, if you will. Why are the wicked prospering? Why is nothing going to be done? And God answers. And in that answer, then, we see Habakkuk writing this commission to announce God's intended judgment. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah described Judah's king Jehoiakim at the time. We went through that in Jeremiah. Chapter 22, verse 17, describes the king. He says, But thine eyes and thy heart are not, but for thy covetousness, and for to shed innocent blood, and for oppression, and for violence to do it. All right, so that's what believers, that's what they were up against, right? A king that uh, was only after his own covetousness. Uh, Micah was the final prophet to the northern kingdom prior to the Assyrian captivity. Habakkuk was written around 620 to 610 BC. And just for some of his contemporaries, we'd see Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zephaniah. Uh, he apparently was one of the Levitical choristers in the temple. And we gather that by the end of chapter 3, uh, verse 19 at the very end, uh, he finishes with, to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. So uh, number six there for you is a similar thought here. This prayer in chapter 3 was actually a song. Uh, it was, was a song and then accompanied by stringed instruments. And this is one of the hardest things uh, in, in scripture to for me to kind of figure out, even with the Psalms, because I'm just not a very musical guy. I can't read notes. Never really been able to read notes. You know, I can kind of follow along with music. But when you see these things written out and you try to then wonder what was the tune to it? You know, what was the uh, the harps or the stringed instruments or the, what, were the, what was the music behind these things? It's just always interesting for me and I think one day we get to heaven we'll be able to answer some of that as well. Uh, Habakkuk is a book about deep doubt. Uh, number seven, he's been called the doubting Thomas of the Old Testament and he was a man that trusted God yet was perplexed and we see that throughout this book as I said a minute ago. We see on one hand the, the grief, the sorrow he's feeling, the, the perplexities of what's going on around him, but then we will see a glimpse that he, even in all of that anguish, has a sense that God's in control. Uh, he encountered two painful problems. Uh, number eight is the first one. Uh, how could God allow the sins of Israel to go unpunished? And he really lays his heart out in chapter 1. Uh, so look at verse 2 of chapter 1. Just going to read down through verse 4. He said, O Lord, how long shall I cry and thou wilt not hear? Even cry out unto thee of violence and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity? Cause me to behold grievance. For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are that rise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slack, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth compass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. So here's his cry. Here's his heart. Well, I, I also see a man that we may say he was a bit of a doubting Thomas, 
but yet he was a man with great compassion. He was concerned about his people. He was concerned about his countrymen that, and how that evil would just continue to be abounding upon them. So when we consider that thought, how could God allow the sins of Israel to go unpunished? Justice had essentially disappeared from the land. That's what he was pointing out. Violence and wickedness were pervasive. God tells him Judah would indeed be punished by the Babylonians. So he gets his answer. We'll see that here in a minute. Number nine was really the second uh, problem he had. How could God justify allowing a godless nation to punish Judah. And there again, he pours his heart out there, really at the end of chapter 1. So look at verse 12. He says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, mine holy one? We shall not die. O Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment. O oh Lord, thou hast ordained them for judgment, and almighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look upon iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he? Notice his prayer here. Right, God, how are you seeing this and not doing anything? How are you uh, seeing this and not saying anything? How can this evil rise up against those that are righteous? Verse 14, and makest men as the fishes of the sea and the creeping thing that have no ruler over them. They take up all of them with the angle and catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore, they sacrifice under their net and burn incense unto their drag, because by their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Notice that prayer, if you will. He says the enemy is, they're, they're happy because of the spoils they're getting. They, they're, they're given incense, they're worshiping because they're fat in their substance. He should, shall they therefore empty their net and not spare continually to slay the nations? And then look at chapter 2, verse 1. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon a tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And there we even get a glimpse then of him wanting to hear God's response. So in the second in the second problem, how could God justify allowing a godless nation to punish Judah? Judah at least were believing in God. Judah had some good men left in the land. God answered that he would judge the Babylonians as well. Number nine, Habakkuk sees one of the greatest manifestations of God's glory and power in all the Bible. And look there in chapter 3. Uh, we, we see some of this description. I'm not going to read all these verses, but verse 1 down through 16, I'll just read a few of them uh, so you can get a sense of uh, what Habakkuk was seeing here. He says, Prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet of Shinganoth, the Lord, I have heard thy speech and was afraid. O Lord, revive thy work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make known and wrath, remember mercy. And here's the description. God, God came from Taman and the Holy One from Mount Param, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. And his brightness was in the light. And he had horns coming out of his hand. And there was uh, the hiding of his power. Before him went the pestilence and burning coals went forth at his feet. He stood and measured the earth and beheld and drove asunder the nations. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. The perpetual hills did bow. His ways are everlasting. He even goes on in verse 10, he says, The mountains saw thee, and they trembled, and overflowing the water passed by. The deep uttered his voice and lifted up his hands on high. The sun and the moon stood in their habitation, and the light of thine arrows they went 
and at the shining of thy glittering spear. He's giving this description of the glory and power of God. Now remember how he started out. Right? He started out in despair. He started out saying, God, where are you? God, we need someone to deliver uh, your people. God, this evil's rising up. Wicked men are, 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 are having their way with your people, yet you're doing nothing. And by the end of this book, he gets a glimpse of who God really is. And he understands that God has all of these things under control. Number 11, Habakkuk's great theo or theological declaration is the just shall live by faith is quoted three times in the New Testament. I'm going to have each of you turn there. So I have somebody turn to Romans chapter 1. I have a volunteer for Romans chapter 1. Quickly, quickly, I'm looking around. Pastor Loggins. I need Galatians chapter 3. Did I see your hand, Mrs. Lane? And then Hebrews chapter 10. Who's got Hebrews? Not all at once now. All right, Ron. All right, so it'd be Romans 117, Galatians 311, Hebrews 1038. So remember, his proclamation is the just shall live by faith. Pastor Jesse, would you read Romans 117? For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. All right, Galatians 311. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. All right, and then Hebrews 10, 38, Ron. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Right. And we're going to see when we're done here tonight how this ties into our life as believers. When we understand that uh, God is just, that he then is in the dealings of all that we're going through, how we, we then live this life in faith, we received him by faith, that then faith helps us, sustains us through all we go through. Habakkuk speaks of that truth these many, many years before. Number 12, we'll tie these things together. Lessons to learn. God is to be worshipped because he is God. God is not to be worshipped just because of the blessings he gives. And he speaks of that truth in chapter 3, uh, verses 17 down through 19. Habakkuk comes to this truth. He says, although the fig tree shall not blossom. Neither shall fruit be in the vines, and labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. So notice that description, right? There's, there's wanting. Uh, there's no fruit there. There's no meat there. Everything's empty. Look at then his response in verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And he goes on in verse 19, the Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hind's feet. And he will make me to walk upon mine hind places. Again, God is to be worshipped because he is God, not because we have blessings in our life. Now, this is a time of year where we thank God for the blessings we have, and we ought to, right? But even if we didn't get to enjoy all these many blessings, we should still worship God because he's God. We should still worship him just for the simple fact that we have a relationship with him. And this is all through scripture. This was really Job come to this understanding. Job chapter 42, 5 and 6, you know the story of Job. He says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. He said, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Job at this point lost everything he had. And come to realize that God is still God. He's worthy to be praised. He's still in control. We read a verse out of Isaiah many times. 55, 8, 9. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts than your thoughts. 
Listen, have you considered that just as of late? We get so muddied down with the things that go on around us, don't we? We get so muddied down with circumstances and uh, all the things that have even happened within our country as of late and even up until today. But yet the Bible declares, again, God has this all under control. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So are we then going to be like Habakkuk and just kind of waller in the, Lord, how come you're not doing anything? Or are we going to stand firm in our faith knowing that God is doing something? He's sovereign and he, he has a plan in all of this. And I believe part of that plan is using us. Right? He's using those of us that are just, those of us that have received uh, Christ by faith uh, to be this light in the dark world around us. Number 13, a person is justified only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know this truth. All right? We're saved by the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. Number 14, we are made just in the sight of a holy God. We know the verses out of Romans chapter 1, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by what? Say it together. The just shall live by faith. So then tonight, are we doing that? Are we, are we practicing that in our life each and every day? Would we say we're living by faith regardless of our circumstances? Regardless of all the whirling that's going on around us? Regardless of all, even all the evil that we may see? Are we simply living by faith? Galatians 3.11, we read it a moment ago. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. Number 15, faith is a way of life for the believer. Because we are accepted as God's beloved, we are just, and we go on and live by faith. Again, are we doing that tonight? Colossians 1, and 23, in the body of the flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Right, so once we become a child of God, this is what God sees in us. We are unblameable. We are unreprovable. If we continue in the faith, grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature, which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Faith ought to be the way of the believer, the way for you and I tonight. Are we then living by faith? It's difficult to do at times, right? We would all be honest with that. We tend to look at circumstances around us and we would say, Lord, you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't seem that you are intervening as quickly as we would like. Or, and Lord, this area of my life, there just seems to be a gap and we don't understand what's going on, whatever that is. It doesn't matter. We've all been there. But yet the Bible declares over and over again, we have something that people don't have, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. And through that relationship, we can go to a holy God. We have access to him, and we live by faith, knowing that if he can save us, he certainly sees us through each day we live. Number 16, as believers, we must remain strong and faithful in the trials and troubles of life. The same faith that saved us on the cross keeps on strengthening us in the crisis of life. Not because of our faith, but because of the one in whom we place our faith in. Consider that tonight just for a moment. All right, go back to the day you were born again. Go back to the day you received Christ. You know your life was changed forever. Right? You know you were transformed. You now became a child of God. You're no longer at enmity with God. That faith you placed in Jesus Christ. Consider that tonight. That's not of what we do. 
It's of who we're trusting in, knowing that God's in control. Isaiah, again, verse chapter 41, says, When the poor and needy seek water, and there is none, and their tongue faileth for thirst, I, the Lord, will hear them, and the God of Israel will not forsake them. I will open rivers in high places and fountain in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land springs of water. What a picture that is. You think of a vast desert, no water to be seen, uh, just quenched of thirst. And God says, if you're a child of mine, I have all things under control. And I will quench that thirst. I will provide exactly what you need. And if we just consider that for a little bit, I think we'd all tonight here say the same thing, that God has provided exactly what we need each and every day. There's nothing we go without. There's nothing that he isn't in control of or sees in your life. So how do we tie this together? There's only a couple more blanks, but I have just a few thoughts. We'll close with these bullet points, really. God, again, is good and right, just in his dealings, and worthy to be praised. Praise him tonight. Spend some time. When we close, spend some time in consideration tonight. If you have time alone with God, just to praise him. Praise him that he is just. Praise him uh, that he, he has all of these things under control. We may not see the outcome. We may not know what his plan is, but we can praise him knowing he's in control. Number 17, we must trust in the justice of God if we are to properly worship and praise him. Let him have it. Let him have the burdens of your heart. Let him have it, the worries or concerns of the day, knowing that he's got it all taken care of. God is to be worshipped simply because he's God. We see that many in the Bible come to know that truth. A person is justified only by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith is a way of life for the believer. And number 18 tonight, your last blank. We must remain strong and faithful in the trials and troubles of life. And I'd have you consider this. There's enough people in the world that go around with doom and gloom. You and I have such a light to share. You and I can endure great difficulties. We can endure great trials. We can endure things. Why? Because we have a relationship with God. So what I'd have you consider is, can then other people see that relationship in you? In those times of trial, do they see you praising the Lord? In those times of trial, do they hear those praises that we often say that, you know what, it's difficult, but God's in control. I don't know how this is going to play out, but I do know God has a plan. I, I don't know what the outcome may be, but I, I understand that God has gotten me through and he will see me through all of these things we go through. Be encouraged by that tonight. And then, and then if you're going through one of these difficult times, I believe Habakkuk was going through a difficult time in his life. This was, this was something that was weighing heavy on his heart in his life. He was pleading with God. He'd come to the point where he said, God, I'm just going to listen. Lord, I've laid my heart out. Now you, you tell me what, what needs to be done, what, what you're going to do. God, in a, in a marvelous way, way, reveals his glory, tells them, I have all of this under control. They're going to be judged. I, I see what's going on. And in that conversation, in him seeking the Lord, God does exactly what he often does for you and I. He just gives us that sense of peace and comfort that God's got it all under control. Now, the key is, are we going to seek the Lord? Are we going to go before him? I think that's one of the greatest lessons we can learn from this man in Scripture is no matter what he was feeling or where he was at in the time of his life, he stopped long enough to say, Lord, I need you. 
Lord, help me with this. Lord, guide me through this. And in that dealing with God, I think God gave him such a peace where at the end of the chapter, he has turned his whole whole thought process, process around to, you know what? If there's no fruit on the vine, if there's no food to be had, God, I'm still going to praise you. You're still worthy to be praised. You're still in control. Look at the transformation just by spending time with the Lord. Let's do that tonight. Let's not get caught up in our circumstances. Let's understand God's in control. Let's live by faith. Let's show those that are without what it is to have joy and peace and contentment so that they may ask, What's different about us? Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you tonight. Lord, we look in these scriptures and there are times I believe we could look at our even our own society, our own country, our own circumstances. And there may be times like Habakkuk, we, we wonder, Lord, why evil prevails. But Lord, you're in control of these things. Lord, you have a purpose, you have a plan, and God, what's so wonderful is in that plan, you're desiring to use your children. You're desiring to use those that have trusted Christ as their Savior. And Lord, I believe there there are many in our church, Lord, that are dealing with things right now. Oh, Lord, friends that we have that are going through circumstances, oh, Lord, where there's a bit of unknown, uh, where, where, Lord, we're, we're seeking your wisdom and direction. And Lord, help each one, all of us included, just to rest as we have learned tonight. That Lord, you take care of all of our need. Even in the times where we feel that maybe there's a bit of drought, you promise that you'll provide. You promise that you'll take care of your child. And Lord, we thank you for those promises. We thank you that those promises never fail. And God, help us, I believe, to have an attitude uh, like Habakkuk had later on, Lord, where he realized who you were. He realized, Lord, that you had all things under control and he relied in you for his strength. God, I pray we would give some time to reflect on that tonight. Lord, encourage each one that's here. Be with the ministries downstairs. Lord, we just pray that the young people, the word of God would again just be engrafted on their heart, Lord, and They'd have a, the true desire to serve you. Lord, bless each one. Lord, we're looking forward to Sunday. We're looking forward, Lord, to just the, the fellowships we'll be having next week through this Thanksgiving time. And I just pray, Lord, you'd bless in a special way. Help us to set some time aside, Lord, to just be with you. Spend some time with you and praise you just because you're our God. We thank you, Lord. We love you tonight and pray that you would Keep us safe as we leave, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you tonight. Be safe out there. Have a great weekend.